So Barb Wallace, I want to thank you for raising the issue of how to service the medium and small employers and thank you for the question that we just heard. Uh, speaking for the NBCH coalition community, I know uh, a lot of coalition directors have been struggling with this issue of how to better service medium and small employers. And it's absolutely right. Uh, they do not have the resources that the jumbo employers have. And I think this idea of building learning networks among uh, employers of similar size, very much what uh, coalitions have been trying to do and I think have more of an interest in doing in the future, is very much part of the solution. So Barb, thanks again for uh, raising that issue. So uh, we're making a bit of a transition here, and uh, my tee up of this conversation is that, you know, I've been a, a bit surprised that we have not heard more discussion of national health care reform uh, legislation and the Affordable uh, Care Act and its impact on the employer community. Um, and now it, it is, of course, clear, unlike a year ago, where I think uh, a lot of employers were sitting on the sidelines, uh, sort of waiting to see what was going to happen with health care reform, that health care reform is marching forward. We had the major Supreme Court decision and, of course, the re-election of President Obama. So, the, you know, in a way, and I feel it in Washington, D.C., the, the day after the election, the floodgates opened and more and more regulations and rules poured out. Uh, and there's so much to talk about in terms of the impact of health care reform legislation on employers, pay or play policies, of course, uh, some very positive things happening in terms of health care delivery reform and Medicare in particular moving in the direction of being more of a value-based purchaser and driving payment reform and, and other issues. But what we wanted to focus on today was really the world of insurance exchanges. Uh, both public and remember after 2017 larger employers can start to move into exchanges but also in particular the very interesting development uh, particularly of late uh, with private exchange uh, development and, and growth over time. Um, so is there an appetite in the employer community for exchanges? Is there an appetite and moving to more, maybe the next phase of consumer directed and consumer choice models? Uh, is, there, is there an appetite for perhaps even a more radical benefit strategy of moving to defined contributions in health insurance benefits, much like the employer community moved when it came to, to pensions uh, over the last two decades? And what does it all mean as it relates to our conversation today and over the next couple of days to uh, the investment willingness of employers to, uh, again, develop uh, and advance very robust worksite and workforce health and productivity issues. So we have the, the rather provocative title of this session can health absence and productivity management uh, survive the world of private and public exchanges? Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce um, the great uh, faculty that we have, presenters. And I think I'm going in the order of presentation here, so correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and again, you have their bios, and in the interest of time, yes, the, the other session ran a little over, so I want to give back a little time to our folks here. We're starting, and Kevin, I hope I get your last name right, Kevin Kikafer, 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 who is the head of sales and market development at Bloom Health. We're next going to hear from Eileen Werner. Senior Manager, Global Compensation and Benefits at Key Safety Systems, Inc. And finally, we're going to hear from William Smith, President of Disability and Life uh, with Anthem, uh, I think a subsidiary of WellPoint, as I understand it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin to start our presentations. Kevin? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. 
uh, thanks for bearing with us. I know people wanted to get out and break, and you pulled them right back in, so I appreciate that. Um, we're going to talk about private exchanges, and I think our really our featured speaker is Eileen, because I applaud all of you. You guys have the hardest job right now in America, and I mean that, because um, you're dealing with employees. These employees are being asked to pay more out of their paycheck, generally, um, and having less benefits as a result of that. And it's not easy. And then you've got CFOs, your C-suite's putting pressure on you to continue to reduce costs. You've got limited staff to do that. And it's not an easy job. So I really appreciate that. And that's why I thought it was important when we put this discussion together to have Eileen, because I have to applaud Eileen. She was one of the first companies in the US to make that leap and jump down that private exchange using a defined contribution uh, concept. So uh, we've got some good results to share with you today. We'll try to save some time for questions at the end, but with that, we'll get started because uh, I know we only have about 60 minutes. So who's Bloom Health? Uh, you can't order flowers on our website, um, as some people thought. Um, but basically, we've got a DNA of startup and innovation. And what I mean by that, our co-founder and uh, CEO, uh, Beer Sin, was one of the six co-founders of Definity, uh, which really started and ushered in the whole consumer-driven health movement. The only reason I touch on that, because we still have the same legal team at Bloom, that at that time they were called personal care counts. There wasn't even an HRA or HSA. Uh, so that legal team went into D.C. to help get that legislation passed. We've actually been into D.C. to talk to our constituents, our senators, our congressmen, uh, the HHS. Uh, that happened when we had an equity event. So in full transparency, in September 2011, uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan, which was the first kind of carrier-based plan out in the marketplace. You'll hear more about that in a little bit. HCSC and Anthem Wellpoint each took a minority stake into Bloom, which adds up to a majority. Uh, the reason I think that's important, because if you put this big definition around exchanges, I would tell you what exchanges are. They're a technology company with a generally good call, serve, call center. So if you don't have carrier, if you don't have product on the shelf, you really don't have anything to deliver. Um, and then from a competitive standpoint, obviously Ann Hewitt's in it, Towers Watson, VN Extend, Mercer's now jumping in through Benefit Focus. So you're getting a lot of consultants, your unbiased third party also providing products. So it's kind of an interesting, it's a very dynamic environment right now. Um, I'd say it's an early market. So where we're at today, and it's actually grown since we had to submit this, we're now at about 175 employers representing close to 125 to 130,000 belly buttons on the platform using Bloom as a defined contribution. We sell direct to large employers. We also sell direct to health plans. So Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan has a product which is called GlidePath. That's what Eileen is using. Uh, we're, Bloom is the technology behind it. We're building out for HCSC. It's going to be called Blue Directions. So in the states that they're selling in, Anthem Wellpoint is Anthem Health Marketplace. The only reason I bring that up is you're going to hear more and more about private exchanges because there's a lot of interest in it. Um, I'd say we've gotten a lot more inbound. You should see my Delta account. I am on the road all the time uh, talking with many employers. I don't necessarily know how many large employers are necessarily going to jump in 1114. I'd say if you added all of the private exchanges together, maybe 20. 25 national size employers. We'll, we'll have a few of those. Um, but we're also doing a lot of planning for 1115, 1116. Um, when we built this company, really our mission is pretty simple. This isn't a new concept. For many of you, um, you're like, Kevin, isn't this kind of cafeteria plans all over again? You know, you're kind of helping people give them more choice, give them, give them account. Never really worked back then, so why is it going to work now? Probably $9,000 is a good reason. Back then, it was about 2,000 PEPY. Now you're looking at 11,000. Also, from a technology standpoint, much more advanced from a technology. And because employees are paying more and more of the freight of their medical care, they want to have choice in the matter. So if you think what we've been doing as a society, in particular in your seats, you would love to give pay increases, right? Because that's what the employees want but you've offset those pay increases because you've had to pay, take some of that to offset medical trend. So there's some good studies out there. What we're doing is we're changing that paradigm shift 
and saying, really should be the employee's choice. Let them choose if they want to take home more pay. We'll show you how you do that. Um, however, when you have that paradigm shift, they need help. We heard the panel talk about advocacy programs. Put us at the very beginning of that. We're helping from a pre-enrollment standpoint, those employees make that decision. Because when you give them more choice, and I'm sure I've had this question asked, Kevin, you want, we offer three benefit plans today and our employees don't understand, and now you want to give them choice of maybe eight to 10. There's no way they're gonna get that. I would ask you don't apply defined benefit thinking in a defined contribution world. Because based on our research, what the employee wants, somewhere between eight to 12. That's an ideal number. They'd like to see a spread of cost between 25 to 45%, meaning the cheapest plan offered to them is gonna be a spread between 25 to 45 amongst the most expensive plan. And we'll show you some earlier results of what we're doing there. It has to be easy for them too. So we build a technology platform that we don't use any healthcare jargon because people don't understand, most employees don't understand what a high deductible health plan is. So why would you use that language when you're helping them pick a plan? We'll show you that too. Generally this comes up, so I'm gonna hit on them real briefly because it is the law of the land now. Um, Obama's been elected um, and it, this isn't really going anywhere. It's getting very confusing. There's um, releases all the time. I'm sure you guys are looking at it. Obviously our carrier partners, our ownership plans are dealing with this. Um, it's going to be an interesting marketplace. I've done a lot of these discussions. I followed the Deputy Director of Insurance of Ohio about two months ago, and she shared with their group, a bunch of employers in the Ohio marketplace, that the individual rates based off of a minimum study in Ohio, and every state's going to be different, um, but what's going to be hosted on the public exchange versus a comparison where the individuals can buy today, the rates are going to go 50 to 80 percent. So that's a big change. Some of it's based on the law, some of it's based on the steps that you can apply. But generally when I'm talking to employers, yes, some employers are gonna go there. Um, I think the, kind of that line in the sand, generally when I'm talking to employers is under 100, um, you know, are taking a harder look at it, particularly if their workforce is subsidy eligible. But once you get over that 100 size, you're generally multi-state employer. Um, so you wanna have control meaning the employer wants to have the control. You want to choose what plan designs are offered. You want to choose what level of money you want to give to your employees. And with that, if you compare it to the public exchange, right now it's just medical and dental. In a private exchange, you can host whatever products you want, and you're going to hear more about that. Um, today, Bloom is really just doing medical um, with pharmacy and some wellness. We're being asked by those employers that we're already servicing, when can we have these other products vision, dental, life, disability. Because once the employees go through this process, remember we have them at hello, people were talking about engagement earlier, you can't get benefits unless you go through this platform. So it's getting that individual and helping them pick the plan that's right for them. The other piece of this, from a service, customer service standpoint, it's not built. People are, the states and the HHS are building this customer service platform. When we met with um, them privately, there's a lot of concern if they can have this up and running by 1114. It might get extended. What does that look like? Maybe it's just a website with some PDFs of plan designs. Nobody knows yet. So there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty of the public exchange marketplace. And private exchanges, um, they're going to continue to come up. Most of these online enrollment companies, um, you'll see press releases almost weekly. We have a private exchange now. We have a private exchange. We've done this. We've done that. Um, so I don't think it's going away. It'll be interesting as we see more results because the large employers like yourselves, you gotta see that before you really step into that environment. We'll definitely have some earlier adopters. It'll be interesting when we look back a year from now, um, the level of membership. I think we'll have 5X growth personally uh, at Bloom um, just because we're getting, with our carrier partners, we're getting this out in the marketplace, our larger carrier partners. So more to come on it. When I think about what needs to be there from a private exchange for it to work well, um, obviously it's a fixed subsidy. Although what's been interesting lately, um, some larger employers, we met one with about 400,000, not, not for 1114, but more of a 1115, they were interested. Question was, Kevin, do we really need a defined contribution account? Can we use your technology, offer more choice, still keep it in a subsidy level and you know, accomplish the same concept? Um, 
I don't know. I, you know, our technology platform's not built there. What's unique about this is our theory was if you tell an employee they're going to get X dollars, number one, we've been getting a lot of consumer feedback of they had no idea that you, the employer, was giving them that much to begin with. And I think that's interesting because a lot of you spend a lot of money on those end of year statements and says this is how much we give you for benefits. They'll look at it and then they'll throw it in the trash and not really commit it. What's interesting here again is we have them at the very beginning. So we post that amount and they buy and shop differently. We want that experience regardless if you're fully insured or self-funded, we can do both. But we want them to feel like they're actually buying something. And when they feel that way, they make different decisions because now it's their money, it's not your money, we all spend that differently. You know, I, I liken it to we've all been to weddings. Weddings are a good time. Actually, we, should have, we, we could have experiments to, to, at the cocktail hour. But what I'm thinking about is when you go to a wedding and it's an open bar, um, people are drinking a lot more champagne, a lot more top shelf liquor, good wines. Everybody has a great time. When you go to a wedding and it's a cash bar, there's a lot more Bud Light, Miller Light being drank. People still have a good time, but they spend their own money differently. And I don't think that apply. I think you can apply that to anything, including benefits, and that's kind of our philosophy here. Um, more design I've talked about. You definitely need more choice. What the consumer wants is they want to be in control over it. Um, because if you think about it, they're paying a big chunk of it today but they're not in control. You're generally trying to pick to a least common denominator. It's a tough job you all have because you're trying to pick a benefit plans that's gonna serve the needs of all of your employees. And generally what we're finding is they're changing 73% of the time. That means we're getting it right about 23%, which isn't bad, um, but they're changing 73% of the time. Generally they're buying down, so they're picking a plan that costs less. You have to support this through not only through a technology plan, but a call center. So we have call centers uh, for those people that don't want to use the decision support technology. Um, however, we create the whole experience over the phone. And what I mean by that is because you're asking these employees to make new decisions, which they haven't had to make, um, they have no idea what plan design is best suited for them. So we try to take about 30 questions. We don't need to do it in 30. We do it in 30 because there's a lot of education that goes on. Most people don't understand the general concepts of insurance. So if I pick a higher deductible, that means I'm going to have to pay more out of my pocket if, at the time of service. But with that, I have to pay less on my paycheck. We ask a very simple question in these 30. And it's interestingly enough, it's really a binary. Um, it, would you choose to pay more out of your paycheck so that you pay less at the time of service? Or would you like to take home more pay so that you pay more at the time of service? People spend a lot of time on that question because they've never had to think about it that way before. Uh, we force those kind of decisions. So when we built the decision support, we focused on three key areas. The first one being their medical condition. And not like a deep dive DNA to where there's a ton of questions around it. Really what we're trying to get to is, are you living with a chronic condition? Are you training for a marathon? Also, how do you interact with the healthcare system? Are you the type of person that goes to the primary care doctor anytime you have a runny nose? Or do you fight it out with home remedies or do you go to a minute clinic? So that's one area. Second is their financial condition. Are they living paycheck to paycheck? Or um, a millionaire or someone in between? Also, are you a spender or a saver? When you buy big ticket items, do you spend time shopping? So we're trying to get that lens to understand them. And the third thing is their risk tolerance. How risk adverse or risk tolerant is the individual? The algorithms and pull from that, what we don't do, and I heard some talk about trust. I would agree. It's very difficult. And I worked for uh, insurance companies for years. You know, you've got generally, um, no offense to Carl, but you've got generally big tobacco, big oil, and then big insurance companies, you know, falling in line that way. There's Carl. Um, just about how society views it. So when we built this model, we wanted to be this trusted advisor. So after we go through those questions, what we don't do is immediately take them to, okay, here's the top recommended plans. Because what happens is it, it, there's this black box to the consumer. They're like, I don't know if I would necessarily trust your algorithms and decision support. So what we do is we present a personality back to them. And the reason we present that personality, what do people love to do? They love to read about themselves. So essentially, you give them a Myers-Briggs of them, again, tied to how they respond to those questions. Then we show them the top features of the plan design that's important to them, again, how they respond to the questions. They can tweak it. 
So if they're like, you know what, I'm really more of a saver, I'm not really you know, in between, so they can change that. It updates the algorithms behind the scene, then we show them the top recommended plants. What just happened in that one little step? They trust the program because they got to put some of their own design to it. And I gotta keep moving here. Um, so for the visual learners in the room, this is essentially what we do. Um, from an employer standpoint, you determine the defined contribution account of those employers that we work with today. No one's necessarily trying to do it to save money year one. Uh, we generally say if you're providing a subsidy level in anywhere between 70 to 80% today, stay there. Um, because you've got, you know, well, Kevin, if we were giving too much money, am I, if I'm running about 78% of my population is taking medical, I don't want to drive more membership in. We have a tool that helps you kind of calculate that and it'll actually look at savings at the employer, employee, and earnings per share on a publicly traded company on a pre-tax basis, the CFOs like that. Um, then the employee determines how they want to spend that money. We host the product, so larger organizations like many of you, you would say we would essentially build your own private exchange for you. It can be branded to you. Uh, I use the term walled garden. You kind of pick the plan designs that you want on that shelf. Um, let those employees make those key decisions. You will be surprised at how they buy because they do buy differently. We'll show you that here in a second. Um, and let's say if you've given somebody $500 and they buy a plan that costs 400 that money today we're using an HRA-based account, so it's notional. That money can be rolled over and can be used for 213D eligible expenses. If they buy a plan that costs more expensive, so $600, um, we still want to take advantage of the pre-tax savings, so we're going to um, handle a payroll report through the employer portal that says X percent of your population picked a plan that costs more, um, so that that can be then passed to your payroll vendor. Um, the products, medical and pharmacy that I mentioned earlier, wellness I think fits in here nicely. You can give more money based on the behavior you want to try to drive as an organization. Ancillary's coming. And um, what's interesting from uh, taking this kind of version 8.0, and I'd say we're at version 2.0, we've got one client that's looking at doing um, their 401k paid time off all under a single silo. Now, when you're throwing those products in, we're not using an HRA account anymore. We're using a cafeteria-based approach because you can't use HRAs to buy life and disability products. Um, value proposition, you know, for you, it's pretty inherent in the, in the medical side is you kind of define and control the spend. It's a different discussion now. We've had some employers that want to tie business metrics to the amount that they were going to put in the defined contribution account. So if their organization does well, they're going to get more money in their DEC. Um, so it's not no longer you kind of beholden to medical trend. Um, from a consumer perspective, you're giving them more choice and more control. The data, so this is what we're seeing. I mentioned already 66% is buying down, 11% are actually buying up, so they're choosing richer plans. Um, what's fascinating to me, because we've all kind of offered or maybe you're going to introduce a high deductible plan and you do all this effort and communication and then you get maybe 5 to 10% of people take it. Through this model, we're seeing 52% of our membership enrolling in HSA eligible plans. Um, it's, I think the key driver there is we're spending the time with them. When we get them on the phone, our average talk times are about 22 minutes. We're walking them through the concept. We're spending time. Again, we have them because they have to go through this process. When you drop down to the next two, employer's annual per employee costs are 20% less in this model. It's not that we, we've solved health care. It's because they're buying down. So if you're buying down, you should have less premium, which then translates to overall less cost. 79% um, of our members find the experience helpful when they talk to our advisors. Our advisors are licensed insurance, you know, they have an insurance license. They don't necessarily need it in a group model because we're doing a group model. Um, but we feel that's important because we pay them slightly above a standard claim and call center rep that you might have at your medical carrier because it's a different conversation. So Glyplath, um, that's a solution that we built with Michigan. As I mentioned, they were one of the first into the market. I think they felt it early on in the retiree space um, be, and extended in via towers. It's a great model for retirees. So that, that was kind of one of the first ones into this space. And they said, you know, we are very interested in doing something in the group active space. So we built that for them. Um, they are an investor. We're, we're essentially Bloom's nowhere behind it. I mean, we're kind of the intel inside. 
uh, of the solution. It's all marketed GlidePath. Um, Michigan chooses the products that they want to host on the shelf. Um, keep in mind, it's a down market strategy for the lady that answered the question, what do we do for a smaller employer? Um, we have packaged plans. Uh, we host plans anywhere from Medica, which is also another partner of ours. They offer 20. Um, GlidePath has five in the down market. So it's again, it's up to the carrier. But with that, this is really why you're here. Um, you want to hear why Eileen chose to go down this path and some of the results that she's, she's seen within her workforce. Backwards. There we go. Good morning. Good morning. Um, key Safety Systems is uh, no relation to Key Bank, <laughs> but if you're in the Detroit market, sometimes there's a confusion with Key Plastics, and there is a bit of a history together uh, with them. So uh, let me give you a little bit of background on <clears throat> Key Safety Systems, or KSS as I call it, a little bit about my background as it relates to this project. And then we'll talk about why key safety systems pick the defined contribution path and glide path in particular, and then what were our outcomes and what are we going to be doing next. So key safety systems is a, about a $1.2 billion privately held company. We're an automotive supplier. We're the fastest growing safety restraint business in the world. And we make seat belts, airbags, steering wheels, and the inflators that inflate those products. Um, and we supply over 300 OEMs, which are the original equipment manufacturers, Ford, Chrysler, GM, Hyundai, BMW, VW, all the, the car brands that you've heard of. And then we do a few on the high end, like Maserati and Jaguar. So, you know, you've got your, uh, the uh, airbag that's in the steering wheel, you've got um, passenger airbags on the driver's side, on the uh, passenger side in the front seat, you've got side curtain airbags, I feel like a flight attendant here, <laughs> you've got side curtain airbags that extend from the, the back seat uh, along the, um, the headliner for the back and the front seat. But one of the cool things we, we created in partnership with Ford Motor over the last couple of years is what's called an inflatable seat belt. And so we combine the inflator technology with the seatbelt technology and using the, the inflator itself, but with the airbag technology, as I say, with the seatbelt technology. Because when you sit in the back seat of a car, your protection is a seatbelt and your side curtain airbags. You can't, you know, my naivete, of course, I asked, why can't you have a seat, an airbag on the back of the, the front seat? Well, that's too variable because you have passengers and drivers with different... Um, you know, leg lengths and arm lengths, and they move the seat back and forth. So it'd be too dangerous to have an airbag on the back of, of the front seat. So uh, what we created was an inflatable seat belt. And what happens is if you've, you've been in a, a sudden stop, your seat belt stops. And believe it or not, there are actually explosives in a, in a seat belt um, that will pull it taut. But in the back seat, you can get damage, internal damage from a seat belt. So we created this inflatable seat belt and it spreads the load and it literally spreads about five inches across your chest. It's particularly good for children because they could uh, slide out from under the seat belt. So that's one of our cool technologies. It's on uh, the Ford Flex, the Ford Explorer, the Lincoln MKT, and it's actually in the, the current ads for Lincoln so you can watch the the seat belt inflate, it's, it's, uh, it's really cool. And then on the high end, when we make steering wheels, if you're driving a Maserati and you have one of those gorgeous steering wheels, it's not just a leather wrap steering wheel, but it could be wood, then of course you've got to have the decorative panels that match, and God forbid that the, uh, the gear shift doesn't match your, your steering wheel, so of course we make those as well. So we have about, um, and we compete with TRW, Auto Leave, and Takata globally. Uh, we have about 8,500 employees globally, and our business is in 12 countries. We have about 35 facilities across those countries and five tech centers in the U.S., uh, Germany, China, Japan, Korea. And our business is split between about a third North America, a third Europe, and a third Asia. And the reason I frame that is that a lot of what I'm going to talk about has to do with what we're doing in the U.S., but the challenge as a global company is how do you create this philosophy globally on total compensation for compensation and benefits, and how do you take what works in one country, that really the best practices, and introduce them to other countries so that we're not operating as a U.S.-centric company, even though we're based in, in uh, the Detroit area 
in Michigan. So in the U.S., of that 8,500 employees, we have about 1,200 employees in the U.S., and we have about 700 non-union employees on our Blue Cross Glide Path platform. And as of this Friday, March 1st, we'll have another 125 union employees uh, as the result of our union negotiations last summer. So my role is I head up global compensation benefits for the company, but I just joined Key Safety Systems a little over a year ago. And the reason that's significant is that uh, I came, I started in the aftermath of the, um, the first open enrollment with GlidePath. So uh, January, we had been through that first open enrollment. I'd never worked for a company with a private exchange before. I'd never worked for a company that shifted from self-insured to insured. It seemed like we were going backwards. And uh, I'd never worked for a company that used a defined contribution model. So it's been a great learning experience. And I'll uh, talk about why that's, that's significant. So why did we go to a defined contribution model? Uh, as with many of you, it's the CEO and the CFO are talking about how do we do reduce the cost and benefits today and in the future. So that was a huge driving force. We also wanted to figure out how do we get employees to voluntarily move to a high deductible plan. Scary concept, uh, and you've probably heard it from your own employees, but to pay you know, $1,500, $3,000 at a front end deductible is pretty scary. So those were two of our goals. Um, we wanted to also increase employee awareness of what we were paying for our benefits plans and really help our employees become more educated consumers. And as we heard about, as Kevin talked about, really making a choice, but you have to understand what your choices are. We wanted to help employees understand what we were paying for our plans, and that's part of being an educated consumer. Uh, we wanted them to stop copying over. We wanted them to put as much care into their health care selection, their benefit selection in particular, as they do with their life insurance plan or their car insurance plan. Um, and it's odd that we don't spend as much time in that decision. Uh, but we knew we needed the tools to help employees because being an automotive supplier, you know, we went through bankruptcy in 1999, we emerged from bankruptcy in 2004, we're owned by a private equity firm, but being in the automotive industry, we are beholden to our customers. And so cost is just a huge, huge issue. And so uh, that is a driving factor in, in what we're doing. So um, we have limited staff. So we knew if we were going to educate our employees, we needed a partner to help us educate our employees. And that's where GlidePath came in. Uh, my um, Blue Cross Blue Shield approached my predecessor and said, uh, how would you like to be part of this pilot with GlidePath? Uh, we think it will help you educate your employees. We'll provide the support. Uh, we've got a call center to support the questions, and that was a real critical part, and as it turned out, was a key part in the success. And one of our results is we reduced our Blue Cross cost by 2.5% for 2013. And that's just uh, highly unusual in this market as, as the renewal. But over the last five years, we've made a huge amount of changes. We moved to a defined contribution model for our medical benefits. In other words, we now have four uh, medical plans, two PPOs, and two high deductible plans. Doesn't matter which plan you choose, our cost is fixed. And that became a driving message during our union negotiations last summer. Um, the union and uh, our negotiating, we have one union in the U.S. in Knoxville, Tennessee. And in 2010, we left the door open to say, we want you to stay on our Blue Cross plan, but if you can find something cheaper, and at that point the threshold was $7,500 per year per employee, you can go find your own plan. And so a year later, the union found their own insurance plan uh, that was a union-based insurance plan, a multi-employer, not a MIWA, but a multi-employer plan, and, um, and moved to that insurance plan. So part of our goal during negotiations this year was to get our union to come back on our Blue Cross plan, had to make some concessions, and I'll, I'll mention a couple of those, but by and large, uh, we wanted them to come back into our plan at the same cost we were paying with non-union employees. Couldn't increase the cost for our non-union employees, and oh, by the way, we were getting out of retiree medical, and actually retiree insurance as a whole. Uh, we were facing a $15.3 million liability in future retiree medical, so we had a driving uh, interest in reducing that cost. So we negotiated with the union, uh, no more retiree medical for the 35 employees who are vested in our pension plan and eligible for future retiree medical, medical. And then in parallel, we worked with our retirees and ended retiree insurance, offered lump sums, got them to sign waivers. Uh, in fact, expecting about 50% of those retirees to sign waivers, and we actually got 100%, uh, which is pretty 
pretty amazing. So that was a significant change. Uh, the, um, we also, over the last five years, have changed benefits design, increased cost sharing, uh, reduced our life insurance from two times to one times for our basic plan. We changed uh, resource partners, not vendors. We changed our broker, so made a lot of significant changes. Going in from 12, 2012 to 2013, we didn't want to do any design changes because uh, we felt our employees had been through a lot of changes at once and we were trying to create some stability there. Uh, the, um, some of the previous employers talked about contributing to an HSA plan. You know, remember, one of our goals was to increase our enrollments in our high deductible plan. We experimented with uh, making a contribution to our HSA, but we found that it did not increase our employee enrollment in the high deductible plan, so we eliminated our contribution to the HSA, and it didn't change things, although I heard a great idea in the earlier presentation about tying that to health outcomes, and that's something we may want to revisit. So a lot of changes over the last number of years, uh, but interesting enough, we've been um, identified or recognized by a consultant as a trend bender because of the way we've been able to contain our medical costs and use our defined contribution model. So uh, our results really were dramatic. And if you look at this slide, uh, the bar in blue is where we were pre-bloom, and that was 2011. The lighter orange, I think it is, or pink, whatever the color is, was 2012. So that's what we're calling first year of bloom or going to glide path. And then the darker orange is our second year. So you can see there's a dramatic change that we experienced going from pre-bloom, you know, before we had this online tool, and then post, and let me give you some stats. For our non-union employees, we decreased our PPO enrollment by 14%, but we actually increased our high deductible enrollment by 80%. <laughs> it's just, when I put together these numbers, it just knocked my socks off. And my cowboy boots, by the way. Sorry, we were in cowboy attire last night and had a, a blast, but I decided to be more professional this morning. So, uh, big 80% shift, which was just a great success. And the one thing that really surprised me is we actually did a separate open enrollment for our union employees because their union insurance contract uh, end date or renewal date was March 1st. So tried to get them on our January 1st date, but we were not successful. So uh, that's why they're starting this, um, this Friday. But they went through their own open enrollment. And in union negotiations, uh, if you, you have to imagine our, our union employees were coming from a zero deductible plan. You ever heard of one of those? No deductible in the insurance plan. You got, you got a hand out there? <laughs> and so there was no surprise that when the union insurance company came back, they were jacking up their rates 45% for March 2013. So that actually helped our negotiations. Um, and when the union moved their em union employees to the insurance company, they neglected to tell them that they were taking on pre-65 retirees. So I think that 45% increase was a reflection of the uh, union insurance company's experience. So at any rate, in, at the table, uh, we had a lot of pushback on high deductible plans. We actually did not expect to offer our $3,000 deductible plan, but in the end, we did. And thanks to uh, Carrie Doran, who was in with Blue Cross, who was down in, at our Knoxville plant doing the open enrollment sessions with our union employees and helping to educate them on high deductible plans, we actually got 25% of our union employees to sign up for high deductible plans, which is incredible. I mean, the cost sharing is, 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 is uh, better. The company is paying more for union employees on our plans than we are for non-union employees, but that was part of our concession. Uh, we also have a, a tobacco surcharge that we charge our union employees. We know there's not a lot of compliance because our Knoxville plant will tell you that there are a lot of smokers who aren't voluntarily paying that charge, but we're not requiring our union employees to, um, to have that, uh, the, um, the tobacco surcharge. Uh, we also require employees' spouses to go on their own health insurance Again, for the union, we said, okay, we'll grandfather employees who are on board by January 1st, but any new employees will require their spouses to go on their own insurance. So anyway, with all those factors and all those concessions, we still got 25% of our union employees to go on the plan. So um, from, then from year one to year two, we actually reduced our Blue Cross medical costs by 2.5%, which is just unheard of. So the message we were able to give to our employees is we kept our costs flat for 2013. There was a slight increase in our dental costs uh, through Delta Dental, 
Um, we passed that on to employees, but we were able to keep their medical costs flat. Uh, and then there was a negligible increase in high deductible enrollments from year one to year two. So the question is, why the dramatic increase? And we think what explains it is we have better educated consumers. And thanks to the GlidePath tool, uh, employees either through the online open enrollment and questionnaire or through talking to the, um, uh, the GlidePath advisors, and we had about 400 employees call during the first year. So through that experience, employees really thought more consciously about their choices for medical care and therefore um, shifted their thinking and realized that high deductible plans aren't quite as scary and daunting as, uh, as they first thought, that if you, you look at the big picture, you're taking less out of your paycheck, and in the auto industry, we indeed uh, have not been giving a lot of pay increases over the last couple of years, uh, so you do have more money in your pocket. Um, and then there was individual coaching that goes on, and as an employer, I, I like the idea of not talking to our employees about their health care, and you know, it, it's a struggle, because I like giving that personal attention. Unfortunately, I have a it's kind of me, myself, and I, and, and somebody helping out with, with um, benefits billing, but I don't have time to talk to every employee, unfortunately. And as an employer, it just makes me a little queasy to know too much about my employees' um, personal health issues. As an employee, I don't want my employer knowing about a lot of my personal health issues. So having that coaching with GlidePath is a big help, and I, uh, we certainly will move beyond that. Um, going forward, uh, we need to continue to reduce costs, look at, uh, heard a lot of great ideas this morning from the first panel of how you uh, can use a health advocate to look at all your plans and integrate your plans. We want to look at defined contribution beyond medical, just um, our medical benefits and look at it for dental, for vision, uh, disability management, really any opportunity we have to help employees uh, take better ownership of their, their health care and also help decrease our costs. Uh, and the other challenge is going back to be a global company, we want to introduce this defined contribution concept outside the U.S. Because in most of the countries we operate, Mexico, Germany, uh, Romania, it Italy, China, Japan, Korea, uh, most of those countries have statutory requirements on the types of benefits you offer. We do offer some supplemental benefits in addition to those, but right now we're paying 100% of those. So starting with Mexico, because we're starting to relook and going through a benefits renewal in Mexico, we want to introduce the whole concept of cost sharing, picking up more of, of those supplemental costs. So that'll take a lot of education on that part, on, uh, in doing that. So our results from, or our outcomes from this experiment, uh, from our CEO and CFO standpoint, it was controlling our costs. And, and not only controlling our costs, but really making the costs predictable for our benefits plans. And part of that was shifting from a self-insured plan to insured plan, because the GlidePath platform right now only supports insured plans. Again, being new to that myself, I thought that was a strange idea. But in fact, the good news is it makes our costs predictable. And uh, there, we had some initial runouts last year in the first quarter, but beyond that, from quarter to quarter, we know what our benefits cost will be based upon enrollments. Uh, it creates a long-term savings, and of course, we had that cost reduction the first year, and we hope to continue to experience the cost reduction. There's an administrative relief on us because the calls are going to GlidePath. We're trying to offer as much information as we can on our intranet, but uh, having glide path available and those advisors available for questions is huge. And then our employees became more satisfied shoppers and more educated shoppers and making a more conscious choice about their plan. Uh, so a lot of positive things about this. A um, couple of the challenges that we dealt with, and I don't want to be a Pollyanna here and say everything was perfect because it never is. You can have the greatest design, but until you implement, you never quite know how it's going to work. A um, couple of challenges. In the first year, we had a lot of employees who went through the whole online process and somehow didn't click that complete or submit button at the end. And the irony is I started in January, my benefits started in, in May, and I knew this was an issue. So I really went through that interview process carefully with GlidePath and I'm looking for that green check and I'm gonna check that box and make sure that I complete my enrollment. And what do you know, I missed it. 
I think it was a glitch in the system. I can't believe that I would have missed it. But at any rate, it made it crystal clear to me that that was one of the things we had to fix for this year. And GlidePath was terrific, or Bloom was terrific in, in fixing that for us. So it's, now it's a really big green check. You can't miss it. And then you get your statement. So if there's ever any issue, you can pull out your statement and say, well, this is what I enrolled in. Um, the other issue is that right now there is no data feed between GlidePath and our Ceridian payroll plan, payroll system, or from Ceridian back to GlidePath. And that's a challenge because whenever we have new hires and enrolling through our Ceridian system, uh, it's a manual data entry on the Blue Cross side. And as we all know, you get errors when you have manual data entry. And then when we do the open enrollment to bring the data back from GlidePath into our payroll system, we had to pay an extra project uh, for, from uh, Ceridian to do the import. And we had some glitches in it in December. When I'm happy to report, though, that when we did the import for the union enrollment last Friday, it went without a hitch. So that's, that's the good thing. So I'll be first in line when you guys are ready for that, that data feed. Uh, the other thing is that we still have two systems. Uh, we heard a lot this morning about integrating systems and making things easier for employees. We always had this open enrollment for all the benefits through Ceridian, through our, our online uh, self-service. But when we introduced GlidePath, we carved out the medical so that they have to go to, through GlidePath for the medical enrollment and to contribute to their HSA. And then they go through Ceridian for the other open enrollment. So one of our challenges is figuring out how to integrate that so employees only have one place to enroll. Um, so that is, that's a challenge. Um, and that, that's pretty much it. It, uh, it was a great, it's been a great experience, great partnership with Bloom and with Blue Cross, really the three of us working to improve this. So I will now turn it over and to Bill and look forward to taking your questions. Thanks, Eileen, I appreciate it. As you heard from, um, from Eileen and Kevin, um, there's a lot of ops, obviously a lot going on in our space and a lot of things to think about as we uh, continue to go down the path of the exchanges. One of the things I wanted to do is kind of take a step up and, um, actually we're having trouble with the slide here. It's the button on the right. Oh, here we go. Is to just take a step back and just talk about the disability and more importantly the productivity piece of all this because obviously this is all exciting, it's a change in our industry, but uh, one of the things we're passionate about at, at Anthem Life, which is obviously a subsidiary of WellPoint, which is a huge medical carrier, is the fact that productivity is one of the key things that we think all of us should be looking at as employer groups as well as insurance. And our passion around this is reflected in one of our products, which is Productivity Solutions, which this was kind of banded about a little bit earlier today. We actually offer this product down to, to two lives. So we actually have a lot of uh, passion, a lot of experience with this product. And um, we, again, we think it really drives a lot of the opportunity in the industry. Productivity, as everyone knows, has been something from an integration perspective that's been kind of being explored over the last decade, 15 years. Just as you kind of take a look at it, just as a reminder here, as we think about what, what the future holds with exchanges and, and as employer groups and consultants think about what kind of impacts they need to do as they think about their plans, one thing we want to be careful of is that we don't take a step back on the, on the productivity piece of it. I think one of the cautionary pieces I'd like to throw out there today and leave folks with is as you start to make the decisions, remember the, the strides we've made in productivity and also remember the impact that disability does have on medical costs. So, the, really the key takeaway from this slide is the fact that the 11% of folks that have disability issues actually are driving about 53% of the medical costs. So there's comorbidities, there's chronic conditions that a lot of these folks deal with. So that is actually something that we really need to continue to think about as we make benefit decisions. On the next slide, it gets back to, again, I think a lot of the C-suite folks are always kind of looking for cost saves and looking at, at ways to actually be obviously as productive at the same time. This slide, I think, is really important because it mentions the fact that even if you ask the CFOs, the majority of them see that there is some link to health and productivity. And actually, the more embedded in the kind of integrated model, actually, and the ones that are more uh, in line with the fact that we've got to look at the holistic uh, person, not just their medical cost, I think there's even a higher preponderance of folks that feel that there's a strong correlation between the two. Now, as, as Eileen mentioned earlier, obviously, this could be in conflict because when folks are making budget decisions and they're just looking at the poor people 
pure benefit cost of it. Sometimes, although philosophically they agree with this statement, you know, they do get conflicted when they're, when they're actually looking at the actual dollars. And one of the things that we would just want to remind folks are, are, is that you do have to look at both pieces. And actually the productivity piece, when you've got the right integration with the wellness programs, with your medical programs and your disability, is still the best way to go. And it's, it's a relatively low cost. One of the things that we would throw out there is obviously a continuum of productivity. So as you think about it from our perspective, the, the, perfect, the perfect option would be to have an integrated play with your medical, your disability, your FML, your, your wellness program. So everyone working together from a holistic perspective, looking at, the, looking at the person, trying to make them as healthy and productive as possible. So we know that's a perfect world. You know, we would call it the holy grail of, of productivity. So if folks were all kind of oriented around this as the, as the perfect model, we would propose this would be the solution we also would like folks to do. Um, the other thing we'd like to throw out there, as I just mentioned earlier, as you start to think about your decisions, whether you're an employer group or a consultant helping the employer groups, is just remember as you think about whether you're going to do something different with your medical program, whether it's going to a private exchange or, or some other option, just remember from a cost perspective, when you think about the value of disability to your employees, it's relatively low cost compared to the medical products. You're looking at you know, a good integrated plan of STD, LTD, roughly about $400 versus about $11,000 for medical. So the, 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 the point I'd throw out there is whether you think about you're going to a private exchange where a lot of folks may be thinking of going, ultimately even a public exchange, just take a step back and think about the productivity integration piece with all the other packages. And at a minimum, if you are going to disaggregate some of your benefits, you may want to think about from kind of a, a, an overall perspective that it's still a lot, of, a lot of value in offering a disability product to your employee groups. So as you think about the health care reform and what that may do in the benefit space, I think Kevin did a good job really laying out um, what, what we think is going to be kind of a, a big issue with the Bloom Exchange and what some of the opportunities out there will be from the private perspective. I think Eileen gave a really good overview of how she, from an employer perspective, looks at this and how she kind of works with the rest of her team to make decisions. Again, back to as you, as you kind of think about what you want to do with your groups going forward, obviously two things could happen on the, on, the, on the exchanges. One is you could get out of the medical, push everything out there on a defined per, uh, program like we just talked about, so the ancillary and the medical, everything kind of splits. Or in some cases, folks may still offer medical, but put everything on the ancillary into a voluntary perspective. So again, I would just remind folks, as you think about that, beyond the benefit cost, just think about the overall productivity. And what I'll get to in a second is if you think about the demographics of our country and where things are going, and you think about some of the dependencies we do have on our labor force, particularly in certain industries, again, when you think about the relative cost of $400 a year versus the benefit of actually having the integration with the other pieces of a wellness program, an FML program, where you could actually be after um, the disabling events quicker and trying to get folks back to their productivity sooner. Those are all things that we would ar ar argue are things to consider as you think about your benefit choices in this kind of emerging marketplace. So I think this is a compelling statistic right here. If you think about the poor health and its impact on productivity, you're talking about almost $600 billion a year. So, you know, I think we all know folks that, you know, obviously have the right intentions. They want to be working, but they've got chronic conditions. They've got a lot of comorbidities. Uh, you know, we all know metabolic disease is rising in this country. So obviously I think this number is, is compelling, but if you think about it, it could get a lot worse when you look at the, at the demographics out there. So I think this integrated play and the, the obviously looking at the folks from a whole holistic perspective, not just from a benefit cost perspective, but in total, I think we'll continue to take on increasing importance as we go forward. So here's some potential consequences from you as an employer as you think about this. Obviously, from a competitive perspective, folks are going to take different strategies around how they're going to orient around their benefit discussions in the future. So there's an attractiveness issue to it. Obviously, folks still, I think we all have families out there, even single folks, are still looking to see what kind of medical coverage, what kind of other benefits you get with an employer group. So there's obviously a competitive and an attractiveness nature to it, whether you're attracting new folks or you're trying to retain your existing sale, uh, force. It's going to be critical that you think about this. Um, I also think, you know, the fact that your competitiveness of your organization, if you think about how global the economies become in the world, obviously people really drive a lot of our economy, particularly in the U.S., because we've become such a service-oriented economy. So obviously there's a lot of key dependencies, whether it's different trades or it's different folks in your organization that you really can't have them being unproductive or out of work for a period of time. So these are things, again, beyond just the benefit costs that I would just caution folks to think about as you make your decisions both now and into the future world here. 
The next slide is, 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 is kind of, a, I think, a, an interesting demographic and an interesting uh, point to, to make here. The thing is you also have to be careful when you shift to LTD uh, voluntary plans in total. Uh, if you look at the overall, split, what this is saying here is if you look at kind of stack it going up from a risk perspective, it just looks at medical inflation of about 6% a year. It starts to build in some of the demographic features that I was just talking about, aging workforce, more metabolic conditions, more chronic conditions in total. And then you start to look at the fact that baby boomers are going to be working late, later in life. I think I just saw something again last night where a lot of folks are really concerned about when they'll be able to retire. So obviously as these folks get into the workforce longer, some of, the, some of these chronic conditions are going to get worse. There's going to be more health outcomes at stake, et cetera. And, and I think that the thing that we're trying to point out here is if you just go to a pure voluntary model, there's an additional cost to that that's, that's being projected to add about mid-single digits to your overall cost. So again, when you think about the few hundred hours that you'd spend on a, on a, on a employee-based, employer-based program, you need to think about it in the context of what it's doing to your overall medical cost as well, because it's driving, it's driving it up a little bit extra than, than just if someone had an employer-based group. So again, as I've alluded to all along, if you look at the macro factors, they're kind of compelling and also kind of scary if you think about it. Um, you know, the workforce is getting older. Our, our health in our country with obesity, and like I said, the, the results of what that does to folks is getting worse. Um, you still have young folks, despite all the warnings that, that we all see that are out there smoking every day, we're picking up new smokers. So, you know, again, the whole, the whole kind of environment out there, from, from when you think about it from a productivity perspective, is at risk, as well as a health outcomes perspective. So, you know, we just, again, would throw those out there. If anything, it's a challenging environment today, and it's going to continue to get more challenging in the future when all these demographic factors play into some of the employer challenges around health costs and people trying to keep uh, kind of a balance between what they can afford for their benefits and their medical costs with their overall uh, other challenges in life. I just think that, again, as you think about where you're going to go with your decisions, I would just remind everyone that the disability uh, product in particular is something you want to really think about because it allows us to kind of get after some of these issues sooner. So if you get the right com combination of an integrated medical disability play with an employer group who's motivated to keep their employees healthy and on the job, um, the, this is the important things to think about going forward. So what's an employer to do to wrap it up? One is obviously look at the total picture, not just the benefit cost. As I mentioned, when you think about just the benefit cost, it could lead you to one decision. When you think about the fact when you start disaggregating some of these benefits, what it could do to an outcomes base, whether it's productivity or even medical cost, it's something to really take a pause and take a look at uh, what you think is the right outcome for yourself and your, and your group. Um, Again, we would, we would actually propose, as we say in number two here, that the folks maintain some level of coverage for their employees so that there's some level of base coverage. Even if you want to provide buy-up options, it still allows you to, uh, to give them some kind of base coverage to keep this kind of alignment going between the medical and the disability side, including the health coaching and things of, of that nature. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we like the integrated play. We, we as part of a, a large healthcare company, see the value when you can connect the case managers and you can actually have the wellness coaches work with disability and, and also work with the, uh, the whole medical side. It obviously allows to look at it from a holistic versus just an episodic perspective. And we actually believe that's the right way to go. And I think it's the right way for the you know, employee groups to think about it. And the last thing I'd say is obviously it's a changing landscape out there. I think Kevin did a great job early on kind of laying out at least what the private ex exchanges are doing. Just to remind folks again that you know, disability is important. It's very important that you maintain some level of disability and wellness coverage so that you allow yourself to have these integration plays going forward. And obviously the market will continue to evolve, but obviously that will become much more challenging as we start to look at different choices and things like that, particularly when folks are under pressure from a budget perspective. So what we're asking people in closing here, and I'm going to turn it back over to Kevin, is just think about things across the horizon. It's more than just a benefit cost. There's a productivity element here, and there's also the opportunity to have a healthier uh, workforce out there that everyone obviously is, is aspiring to. So I'm going to turn it back to, to Kevin for a second, and then we'll take some uh, questions. Thanks, Bill. Um, just wrap it up. Um, so future stay. As I mentioned earlier, we, we do have some uh, larger employers taking a look into um, for 1114 and 1115. Can we go beyond just the medical, dental, the core benefits? And short answer is yes. So we're building that from a technology standpoint. 
where they want to allow their employees, give them the choice how they want to spend their money. So if they want to buy down from a medical standpoint so they have more time off, they can do that. Paid time off, um, it does flow into the 401k. So the Academy Award person's given me one minute, and I know you guys are uh, um, patiently have listened to us, so I appreciate that. I, with that, I'll open up the questions. I guess we have one minute for questions, so sorry we went too long. I know that, man. Ken Wexler. It's not a plant. Make it an easy question. Great uh, presentation. And so my question, I guess, is for you know Kevin um, or uh, Eileen on the increase that you saw, which was fantastic, a negative 2.5%. Was that the actual increase or decrease across the four plans you offered, or was that the result of people continuing to buy down in their choices in 2013? I guess, I guess it was both is probably the, the quick answer, but it, is, it was across the four plans, the two PPO plans and the two high deductible plans, and that was, that was um, the new rate that Blue Cross came back to us. Uh, and, and impacted by the shift to um, the high deductible plans. So does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. <laughs> we have time for one more question in the back here. And please introduce yourself. Here comes a mic. I know that person that's going to ask a question. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lauren Vella with the Silicon Valley Employers Forum. Um, my question is for Eileen. As I understood it, and I might be mistaken, I think that Bloom Health said that they can administer uh, fully insured or self-insured, yet you chose to move from a self-insured plan to a fully insured plan. Can, can you share with us some of your thinking around that? Um, and, and Kevin, you'll have to help me out here. I, was, <laughs> I wasn't with the, it predates me. I wasn't with the company. Um, if that's true, I think it's a new change. My understanding was at the time that we introduced GlidePath, that was not an option, that the only option was to move from a, a self-insured plan to an insured plan. Just think, nice job. Um, it was uh, definitely that. It was a decision by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan to, to start with fully insured only plans. So we now are rolling out with them for this year, self-insured. Um, I, I'm always very cautious, though, to point out to a CFO, um, to he and she, that don't assume if you're going to self-funded, I would call it pseudo-defined contribution. What I mean by that, don't just run the math. Don't take the defined contribution amount, multiply it by, multiply it out, because at the end of the day, the claims will be the claims, and staying self-funded, you're responsible for that. However, with that, I think there's obviously, you're, you're, many of those large employers were self-funded for a reason, for premium tax savings, for all the other reasons and, and we can't support that. Because ultimately we, we do have self-funded clients, they don't buy any differently. And I, I, would, I would just add to that that um, <laughs> even though it, it was a change, I in my naivete assumed that once GlidePath offered a self-insurance option that we would go back to insured. I'm not, or sorry, uh, that we would go back to self-insured. I'm not sure we will because uh, being in the auto industry, we have a fluctuation in our income. And so being able to have predictable costs that we have in an insured plan is a huge benefit. And I think it would take a huge sales job to convince our CFO to go back to self-insured now that we're down this path. Well, great, we're at the end. Uh, please join me in uh, thanking Kevin and Eileen and, and Bill.